everybody, it's that time again. You guys have been asking, and it's been a while, uh, but this is, yes, another director's commentary. And we're going right to the one that you guys have been asking for a lot, Norway, the 10 day episode, which was split into two episodes for the series. This will obviously be episode one. But don't forget to take a look at the Survivor Man trains. They basically serve the same as a director's commentary, except that those are a look at the behind the scenes of preparing to do the Survivor Man expeditions. Now, I don't have that for all of the episodes, but in season two, we tried to do that for a number of locations where we filmed me training with different people. In Arizona, that's one. There's a South Pacific, the Kalahari, the South Africa, the Amazon jungle. All of those are episodes, locations, where I caught all of my training on camera before I went in the next week to do the Survivor Man thing. And the reason was, I'd always intended that that would be part of the show, part of the series, as you'd see me training and learning. Uh, anyway, the network didn't want that, so I was just left with all this footage. And now you've got it. So if you want to check those out, they're, they're on this YouTube channel right now. Uh, you can go to the playlists. I think I put them in all the director's comment, in, in the director's commentary playlist as well. Um, but just search for them, Survivor Man Trains, and you'll, you'll, find, uh, you'll find those episodes. We're ready to get into Norway, Survivor Man Norway, and the director's commentary, but in the meantime, don't forget that, well, actually, I'm really proud to announce that my book, my children's book, my first children's book, Wild Outside, Around the World with Survivor Man, has won two national uh, children's book awards for best nonfiction book, best information book, and then is up for two more right now. So that's four national awards, two that I've won, two that I'm up for. I'm just so thrilled. This is for children, uh, really ages five to 14, are loving this book. So if you haven't got that yet, go on my website, by the way, um, www.lestroud.ca. That's my website. Go to the shop page and you can find everything, including this recipe book from season one of the Wild Harvest series, which is also right now, as of this filming, up for three Canadian Screen Awards. Uh, in fact, I'm going next week, getting my suit out, going to Toronto, going to the Canadian Screen Awards, and we're up for best series, best camera, and best music. Uh, very excited going there with Chef Paul Rogowski and Kevin Kosselin and who knows if we win great if we don't as they say just being nominated is already a win so but you can pick up the recipe book from season one again on the Lester shop page all right we're going to watch the Norway one now and by the way if you uh, want to go you can see this episode on this YouTube channel as well straight through uncut no interruptions from me. Uh, but I've seen that, uh, at least I found recently, it's been up for a little while, that you can also buy the Survivor Man episodes on YouTube. Don't do it. That's not me. And um, those people are getting a letter from my lawyer real soon. So uh, do not buy any Survivor Man episodes or anything that Les Stroud has ever done, with the exception of... Uh, I don't own Alaska's Grizzly, Ga Grizzly Gauntlet, which is on the Disney Plus channel in the National Geographic section, Alaska's Grizzly Gauntlet. So that's me hosting that. I don't own that. Uh, the Shark Weeks I did, I don't own those. But just about everything else by me, just come to this YouTube channel and you will see it for free. Okay. Uh, there might be the odd interruption of commercials, but that's what makes the world go around. And I am actually, with a nice segue, because that's probably what's going to happen to me. I've got it queued up, but I've got it queued up to YouTube. So I'm going to watch my own show on YouTube with you guys. And we're going to go into the director's commentary on Norway. Norway, beautiful, yet frigid. Lush, yet rugged. A land of extremes in both climate and topography. You can go from deep snow down to green fjords within a day's trek. This is the harsh and intense land where the Vikings struggled to survive. And like everywhere else in the world, modern adventurers and travelers drive over thousands of miles of snow-covered mountain roads and then get lost and stuck in extreme survival situations. How anyone survives is entirely up to their own will to live and sense of ingenuity. So now it's my turn to show you how a simple mountain drive on a snowy day can turn into a 10 day long struggle to survive. Washington. Let's stop right there. Uh, you, can, you can tell it's been a few years now that I've been making these Survivor Man episodes. A lot more confidence in my narration, the tone of my voice, calmer. It's like, yeah, you know, that's me kind of like, yeah, been here, done this, let's go. And uh, so I really enjoyed that. I told, I've told this story before, so if you haven't watched some of the other director's commentaries that are on this channel, uh, in the playlist, 
you, you might not have heard this story where in the original narration for season one, I believe it was, of Survivor Man, maybe a little season two as well, uh, I wanted the rasp, listen to my voice right now, this is how I sound. If you're hanging out with me, we're having dinner, this is how I sound. But it sounded a little, maybe I did it for this season too, it sounded a little, you know, raspier there. Because it's a nicer voice on television. And uh, to get that raspy voice, it was easy on camera because I was, you know, I was outside and I was working a lot and so the voice was just, had that raspiness to it. But in the studio, I'm coming in from, oh, Queen Street on, in Toronto with a cappuccino in my hand, going into a, you know, a studio, into a vocal booth, and I've got to read in my lines. Now, how am I supposed to, it's, it, in many ways, I couldn't even relate to what I was seeing on screen because of the aforementioned activities before getting into that studio room. So I had to kind of bring myself back there. To do that, I legitimately, and Brian Eimer of Images and Sound, who's done sound for me since Snowshoes and Solitude and still does, every single Survivor Man episode, every Beyond Survivor, uh, Survivor Man episode, Beyond, Beyond Survival, still my favorite series to date, by the way, if you haven't checked that one out, Beyond Survival, check out the playlist for that series, a 10-parter, my favorite. All the Bigfoot, everything, Brian Eimer was my sound guy. I said, have you got a pillow? He goes, yeah. I take a pillow, and I'm like, Aah! and I scream into the pillow as loud as I can, and uh, poof, there's fluff on that pillow, dog fluff, and, and I would blow out my voice. Not good for the vocal cords, but good for narration. Colorado, Nevada for sure. Canada, Norway, wherever there are roads through mountains, there are people willing to take the chance to try to push on through to their destination. Ill-prepared, in bad weather, and bad road conditions. Way too often, the result, stranded vehicles, lost people, and sometimes lost lives. Now, part of this came about on two points, some fluff in my face. And one was that I'm always looking for a realistic scenario to do a survival expedition, and then I would go and do that survival, and then that, I would film that, that'd be Survivor Man, and I would present it to you. And I always wanted realistic survival situations. So I wasn't going to do anything ridiculous and, and um, hyper dramatic. It just had to be, you know, could this really happen with somebody? Well, getting stuck in the mountains, on a mountain road, in the snow, in your car, absolutely could happen and has, has happened to thousands of people. And secondly, I did a special called I Think I Shouldn't Be Alive where they asked me to be a consultant and an on-host sort of dude for uh, the story of the Stolpas who got stuck in their car, I think it was in Nevada, in the snow and they almost died. And I'm pretty sure they lost a lot of their toes. And both, both of those concepts, the fact that I wanted a scenario and that I'd just done that for I shouldn't be alive, I thought, you know, I gotta go do this. I wanna go out and get a car stuck. So remember that, that as I create these Survivor Man episodes, I am creating survival scenarios on purpose so that you can see me go through them as close as I can, approximate it as close as I can to what you might have to go through. Not being a survival guru guy, hey, watch me with all my cool skills, um, but being kind of just new to the scenario, like, okay, this happened, what do I do now? Clearly I had some skills and I could show those, but otherwise it was all about the reality of an actual survival situation. In this case, getting a car stuck in the snow. Why don't people just walk back exactly the way they came, immediately, or wait till the next morning? Even if it was 70 miles back, at least you know where that road leads. For some reason, people would rather take the chance and hike over some hill that they don't know because they think it's a shortcut to safety. And in reality, it's a one-way ticket to hell. Uh, yeah, that's a big thing. Why do you push on and push forward? Even if it's 50 miles, you know that 50 miles. Moving forward thinking, oh, it's only gonna be three miles that way, but you don't know what you're facing. And you have to be highly skilled to push forward with no knowledge of what you're pushing forward into. If you're not highly skilled, then go back the way you came. That is almost always the safest way to go. But especially if you're on a road and you've just, you know, you're out into a snowbank and you're stuck. If you've got the clothing, the boot, the footwear, all of that sort of stuff, walk back the way you came. Best advice in that situation.
So now it's my turn. Stranded for 10 days somewhere in Norway. I'll do what I know is wrong <laughs> so I can figure out a way to make it right and ultimately survive. It's gonna be a long 10 days. The crew heads back down the roads, and in truth, I could just walk out myself in the freezing rain and wet snow, but instead, I'm left alone to attempt survival in a small car. As advantageous as that sounds, there are only six hours of daylight at this latitude, so I've got to get things done quickly before a long night of survival falls on the cold cocoon of the car. Time to warm up a bit. So, a uh, quick comment here. So yes, sometimes people get confused that they're not paying attention, if they're not listening uh, to the narration and so on, they'll see, you know, some, some drone shots there. And this, by the way, was the very beginning. I started using drones. I know some of you guys get tired of the brag here every once in a while, but I am proud of a lot of the different filmmaking techniques that, that necessity being the mother of inventions forced me to do while making Survivor Man because I was completely alone, didn't have a crew. Everybody else always has a crew, so it's very, very difficult. Uh, to capture scenes and at the time I love when something new comes along like GoPros I didn't have GoPros for most of the Survivor Man series that would have been amazing uh, but this is when drones were just beginning to happen and in this case we hired a young couple of guys from Sweden I think that came along or maybe they were from Norway I can't remember uh, and they um, got those drone shots uh, Max Atwood was probably there with me he got a couple of shots and then they leave and I'm left alone. Again, I'm creating a scenario on purpose to teach, to show survival and teach, and thusly teach survival. Um, and I did love that I was finally able to do a survival in a car situation because so many people, I don't know why they don't just leave soon and sp instead they will often spend a lot of time stuck in a car days at a time waiting to be rescued and running out of food, running out of fuel, running out of energy. Uh, so let's carry on. Here's the deal. I'm stuck in a few feet of snow. I'm not going forward or backwards. And by the looks of things, I'm getting really low on gas as well. Let me show you. I think there's two reasons why people tend to stay with their vehicles. Number one is, it seems like an old cliche. We're always told, stay with your vehicle. No matter what, stay with the vehicle. And that's not necessarily always the right thing to do. And number two, you're sure that come morning time, sun's shining, snow's stopped, plow's gonna come along, see you, and you're rescued. But that can be fatal reasoning. You have no idea of knowing how often they plow the road that you're stuck on. And the longer you wait, the more your energy reserves get drained and drained out of you. My survival instinct and training. If you see that shot there, this is when GoPros had just begun. Uh, that's a GoPro, I don't even think they were called Heroes yet, I think it was just called GoPro at the time. You can see the flashing red light because it's positioned on the dash there. So I'm pretty sure, uh, actually I shot Mexico before I shot Norway, and we're, I'm going to do Mexico after the Norway two episodes. Uh, but I'm pretty sure Mexico was the first time that I incorporated GoPros into filming Survivor Man. The, the microphone was awful, you couldn't use the sound at all. And the image was, was okay, it was doable tells me I should leave first thing in the morning. But like a dozen true life survival situations, I'll wait with the car to see if a plow or vehicle comes along. I'm not completely without resources. It was a road trip after all. Mandarin orange. Now this is a bit of uh, deer jerky. And a jar of peanut butter. I wish I could say it was full. It's got about two tablespoons in there only. Uh, still, better than nothing. And also, I guess, uh, leftover uh, coffee cup, actually there's two in there. That might come into some kind of use. And I wasn't so stupid that I didn't at least make sure I brought along a winter coat with me and even some snow pants. So that's gonna make a big difference. I'm gonna have to put on the snow pants really soon actually because if I don't keep this car running and the heat going in here, it gets cold fast. But the stupid thing that I did do was I have no winter boots here. All I have are my hikers and there's gotta be about a foot. Or... I have a feeling that that left camera is black and white because it's a GoPro, and I, if I, I'm sure they were color at first, but I'm, I, I'm, I know they were color. So Barry Farrell, the editor, would have made an editing choice there, saying, "Look, they they might be color, but they look like crap. So let's let's go with black and white. They look they, it looks nicer. It's about creating a really nice look." I was always, I've always been incredibly grateful and thankful for for the uh, 
the skill and talent and creativity that Barry Farrell, the editor, brought to the Surviving Man series to its look. And he would speak in terms of color palettes and sound palettes and things like that. And, uh, and so I'm sure he would have looked at that and said, yeah, no, the GoPro looks like crap, but, it le but we need the shot, so let's make it black and white and it at least will look kind of cool. One thing I've always been a fan of is palette. Uh, and that's one thing that, uh, I, that I wanted to make sure that Survivor Man had is every episode was a palette. And that palette was musical and it was also color. Uh, as, as, and, and just the style of how you, uh, of how things would do, like the darker something would be, it would all be, it'd be you know, it would, it would be like a film noir type of feel to it. So we would apply that type of sensibility to how it was edited and how, uh, uh, how the camera would, would move or not move. Or two or maybe two and a half feet of snow out there. Hope you guys don't mind me talking filmmaking. So far, this one is of my favorite survival parts. Survival in a car. It's a whole different way of thinking, and it's um, it's tricky. It plays on your mind because a lot of me wants to just stay inside the car. When that wind starts blowing and that snow starts falling down, you just you jump into the car like it's your own little cocoon. It doesn't make me want to be proactive. It doesn't make me want to get out and affect any survival. And I'm eating through my food pretty fast. No matter what the situation, rationing food right from the start is a good idea. I can't be sure when the next meal is coming or how a situation might worsen or get better. It takes discipline to ration food, but it means that after a few days of survival, I'll still have some little morsel of food to look forward to, and that's vital for motivating the will to live. Interesting. So yeah, there's two sort of things there. Rationing food right away. It's important. It's, it's you just, you know, oh, we'll be fine. We'll be caught tomorrow. I'm, I'm hungry. I'm going to finish this bag of chips. Today. But you don't know that. And so upon being stuck or lost, uh, seriously lost or just off course, uh, rationing right away, even just a gentle rationing, can be very helpful. Extend your food supply. Make it last longer. We eat more than we need anyway. And if you're just sitting still in a cold car, then you don't need as much food. So rationing right away is important. And if you didn't see it on this YouTube channel, go check out the uh, Survivor Man in, in uh, New York City with Gerard Butler and Mike Coulter. I was honored to work with Lionsgate on promoting the, their new film, Plane. And uh, I asked them about that. That's one of the, the sort of uh, rapid fire survival questions I asked them was, uh, you know, should you, should you ration immediately five days or, t or, or three days or five days? Uh, they both got it wrong, by the way, but the answer is immediately ration. Full moon. So it's really nice and bright out there. You can see really far. Unfortunately, it's um, a waning moon, not a waxing moon. So that would this would have been a time when I was paying very close attention to the full moon cycle because I discovered that if I uh, film Survivor Man expeditions during the full moon. I just had so much more brightness at night and I could use that to my advantage when I was filming. So probably 80% of the Survivor Man episodes were shot during a full moon uh, and on purpose for that reason. It's only gonna keep getting darker. Often in the wintertime, the most beautiful nights are the most deadly. That's true. It's when the nights are clearest and without cloud cover that the temperatures can drop their lowest. I find I have to turn the engine over about once every hour and a half, two hours, just to uh, take the chill out of the inside of the car and get another hour and a half sleep. I forgot to tell you where this car came from. So my very good friend, Anders Hagland from uh, Hella of Norway, the knife company which I'm working with and have been working with for well over 10 years now. Well, over, just over 10 years now. We just had our 10th year anniversary. We have the three knives, the Wabakimi, the... Um, Mandra and the Tomogamy and the Tomogamy I think it's an award-winning knife it's it's I just love it it's a all three knives I designed with Anders he did the heavy lifting and just beautiful handcrafted knives from Hella of Norway well Anders helped me get this whole show together and he sourced this car I said look I need a car that will drive that I can get stuck and that also I might trash so we use the production money, we buy the car so we can do whatever we want with it. It was not the case when I was in South Africa. I wasn't really allowed to trash that Jeep in South Africa. The ATV in Tomogamy with Bob, I wanted to keep the ATV so I didn't really want to trash it. 
Uh, coming up in Mexico, the boat, we bought that boat so we could trash it. So it depends on the episode. Sometimes I was able to trash, trash the vehicle and do what I want. Other times I couldn't really. Uh, in this case, I could do what I want. But what you discover quickly when people say, oh, you could just like take this out of the car and take that out of the car. Yeah, no, you can't. Everything's attached with big, heavy bolts. You need serious tools to take a car apart. You don't do it with a multi-tool. Anyway, let's keep watching. So beautiful there. I'm sitting in here in the car, and it's blowing like crazy outside. The wind is whipping by. It's turned all gray and cloudy, and the snow's blowing off the trees. I'm much better off inside the car. By the way, some of you really bitch about the commercials on the YouTube films. It's what makes it possible for me to be able to afford to have an editor help me put these films together to put them on YouTube for free for you to watch. So skip the ads if you want, but they gotta be there. They make, they, they make this particular world go round. My problem now is not that it's too cold, but rather that it's not cold enough, making the snow outside wet, and as a result, making hypothermia much more likely. The night was pretty much turning the engine over, maybe once every hour, hour and a half, put a little bit of heat into the car and try to sleep a little bit longer. I think I get it now. If I were 60 miles, 70 miles, or a few hours drive into a road like this, with the wind blowing the way it is and the snow and only a pair of hikers, and my mind is thinking someone's gonna come along and plow this road, I wouldn't wanna leave the vehicle either. I can't. It's a really good point, so you see, Kind of like, you know, having to eat my own words. It's true. Easy for me to judge and say, why don't you just leave the car there and walk back the way you came, as I said earlier. Well, in my case, you know, the, the, the breakdown happens uh, close to the night, so I'm stuck. Only have, you know, hiking shoes. So you, I wake up the next morning, and it's like this. And it was, it was cold. Even if it's wet, the wind was whipping. So... You can never be an armchair critic when it comes to survival and sit there and go, oh, why didn't they just do this or just do that? You've got to be in the situation to really, to really judge it and know what's going on. Surviving here forever. It takes a lot of moxie to walk away from the secure shelter of a car. Yeah, I got to say that much. Uh, having the uh, car as a shelter was a massive bonus, not having to build a shelter. I don't think I had to build, did I have to? Oh yeah, I did spend a, a night out in episode two. I think I did. All right, let's keep watching. I just want to check out where I am. I'm going nowhere. Look that car. Oh, by the way, I did say that I could just walk out. It's true. I wasn't actually all that far from a lodge. Like it's sort of up and over the hill and down and around, sort of down a, some other road or something like that. So, so I wasn't that far from where there was a lodge. For those of you who are familiar with the series, and you know that I've mentioned that a couple of times, yeah, I, I could have walked out to the highway or oh, I could have gone around the beach to that. The point was that I wasn't going to. And I needed a place where I could go and carry out the survival and I had to be able to get there. Um, and, uh, and just stay and do my thing. So yes, this is one of those cases where I wasn't dropped off way out in the middle of nowhere. But you know, not ironically, isn't that the way of actual survival? People, more people, the stats are, more people are lost two miles from their home than any other geographical location. So uh, here I was, however far from wherever that other, the lodge was. And I, I know it was there because that's where the crew was staying. So Max was there getting his beauty shots in Norway and I'll comment on that in a bit. And I think Laura Bombay there was doing still photography, although it was nothing for her to photograph until I come out. And uh, might've had a field producer. I can't remember if we had a field producer for this or not. Uh, but in any event, that's where they were. So not to overexplain it, but there you go. Oh. This wind chill is a bit much. Wow. So I'm up above the fjord. See it way down there. This whole area I'm up above ends in cliffs. So I can't get down to the fjord from here. Wouldn't matter if I could anyway. This time of year, there's really nobody out there. It's very important that I at least get the lay of the land. And uh, figure out what's around me. 
Yeah, reconnaissance missions in a survival situation, always vital. Spiderweb your, yourself out, back, out, back, out, back, out, back to check out what's just up over there. Really important to do that. That's how you, you, you spot cabins or roads out. But you do it in, as a, in, in a way of like a reconnaissance mission. You go out, you, fit, you, you measure your distance out, you measure your time walking, and then you come back in the same straight line. And then you do it again, maybe the next day, going out on like, well, spokes of a wheel. Check this out. A little bonus here. This is some old trailer left off the side. But actually, check it out. There you go. Because that, to me, looks like fire starter. That's the beauty of being stranded by a road. Sometimes there are buildings and workers' equipment, things like that you can take advantage of. <sighs> OK. The key to surviving a situation like this is the same as every situation. You've got to assess what, it, what I like, sort of, the, I call it like the three zones, I guess. Zone number one is what you have immediately on your body. I know that I've got a bit of food and I know what clothing I have. Zone number two is what you have in your immediate surroundings. So in this case, it's going to be the car. I still have to check that out. And then zone number three would be in your extended surroundings and what goes beyond that. When I have those three assessments done, then, and I think only then, can I make a proper and informed decision on how to survive a situation like this. All right, I have left until this morning to take a look at the survival gear. Important thing there, those three zones of assessment, the survivor man zones of assessment, I think they help a lot in making a proactive decision and knowing what to do next. What's close on hand, you're on your body, in your pockets, what's, what's right around you, your backpack, the canoe, and what's further afield, the, the cabin upstream, that kind of thing. You do that assessment and you get a lot of knowledge in 60 seconds in your brain and you can make a proper decision. Now right here, I think I'm about to take a look at the supplies. And again, I just sort of thought, well, you know, what would most people have? That's why I have a tangerine and a little bit of peanut butter. You know, I'm not just naked in the car. Uh, so you would have a few little things, but how, how do these things aid in survival? And let's take a look what's in the car. It's my belief that every single car should have a well-stocked survival kit. Maybe some extra clothing, boots would be nice, which I don't have. Um, it doesn't matter where you live, you find yourself stuck, it could make a big difference to have a basic survival kit. You don't even have to carry it. You can just pack it away, put it in the car or truck or van or whatever you have, and forget it's there until you absolutely need it. So let's see what I got. Standard stuff, of course, jumper cables, snow scraper. Six pack of beer, sleeping bag, car survival kit. Let's see what's in here though. First aid tape. I forgot how cool the music was. We really got a handle on doing some great music over the years. The composers being Ian O.J., Peter Cleish, George Catapan, Richard Jackson, Brian Potvin. Um, primarily, I would say probably uh, Peter Cleish in the beginning, and then later more uh, George Catapan. And, uh, and Ian Oje, uh, and I think Ian and Richard. So, uh, yeah, just great music. Duct tape, a knife. And my theme song, which, by the way, the theme song you heard off the top of this show was 2.0 theme song. I said, you know, we've been using the same theme song. I love it. Let's keep using it, but let me, let, let, let me rock it up a bit so you hear my blistering harmonica and stuff like that going on. But it's the same theme, so that you recognize it, just kind of updated. A beautiful knife. Balaclava type hat, emergency reflective vest, bracelet that you can wear, becomes rope. Excellent, little pot for boiling. Oh, in. let me comment on those right now. Yeah, so the idea here was I, I'm, a, I'm a guy who's smart enough to have a survival kit in there. Or maybe uh, my parents bought me one for Christmas and I threw it in the back of the car. I mean, that's often the case, right? So, so in, to my mind, this gives me an awful lot of advantages. But let me touch on those, those wrist survival um, kits, you can, you, they're braided and you put them on your wrist or they even have them as belts now. No offense to everyone who makes those and markets them, uh, I hate them. Hate them. I've used them, I've pulled them out. They're just a pain in the butt. I, just have a kit, you know, or a small kit, you know. It's, just, it's like, oh no, but then they're always handy. Is Yeah, I suppose. Uh, but when, you know, push comes to shove, they're not 
they're not as handy as if the stuff was just accessible. And undoing those braids is always a pain in the butt. So if you can make one where you can just pull one line and go and it undoes, great. But often, I've, everyone I've tried anyway, the way the braid works, it's a long time, like an hour or more. Well, that's not so good when the storm's coming in. So I've never really, uh, I, don't, I don't usually advise those, uh, those little braid, braided wrist survival kits. Get a, get, get a real kit. Emergency blanket. Your life might depend on it. Orange garbage bag, just a clear plastic tube. You never know when that's gonna come in handy. A couple of flares, some rope, a couple of matches. Also got this little mini stove here. One of my favorites is a folding saw. One candle, a wind up flashlight. And last but not least, a little hatchet. That's terrific. So. This is almost gonna be like camping for me. It's a pretty decently stocked car survival kit. I wouldn't suggest that everything is here that I would need, but uh, there should be some advantages to this. Oh, wow. It's blowing in strong. OK, I got to get inside. It's uh, so much for a little break in the weather. Here comes the snow. And see, this is the reality of, of survival in these outdoor situations. You think, oh, I'll just do this or I'll just do that. And then the weather kicks in, and it's chasing me right back in. It doesn't matter what I have in that survival kit now. The weather's chasing me right back into the car. You know those times when you get in your car while well, it's a winter storm on the outside and you just go, oh, finally, and you're inside? Well, that's times 100 when you're in a situation like this. It's blizzarding out there at this point. It's a whiteout, can't see across the fjord. Wind's blowing, snow's blowing, and it's a bit of a wet snow. I'm not going to keep starting the engine. I haven't started it for quite a while because I've been moving around, so I'm warmed up. There's no point in trying to be all cozy and comfortable. I'll just start up when I really, really desperately need to take the chill out of the inside. At least now I know what I have in terms of survival gear. The sleeping bag is huge. It's an old one and it's slightly wet on one end, but at least it's there and I can make use of it. Although, the six pack of beer, now that's a nice advantage. Cheers. Ah, look what we did there. We duct taped up the beer can so that you can't see the brand. Had to do stuff like that all the time for the networks. I think it's silly. I think it's stupid. I don't care if a brand gets shown on, it, on my work. And I love that in YouTube, doing YouTube stuff. I don't, I don't cover anything up anymore. Um, oh, no, we can't do it because they're not sponsoring the show. They're getting free advertisement. Ah, whatever. Chillax. But they never could. So duct taped that up so I wouldn't have to hear it from the networks. And... Uh, I will say this about drinking alcohol in a survival situation. Uh, you get loopy pretty quickly because there's no food in your stomach. Oh. Oh. That's breakfast, lunch, and dinner right there. Recently, there was a story of a man who survived, uh, and all he had with him was, I think, a six-pack of beer, frozen. So some nutrients are better than none. Not even two days into surviving, and the wet and cold weather of Norway has already started to make the car feel cramped and small inside. I'm not sure when I'll get up the nerve to leave this metal cocoon. It's starting to feel claustrophobic stuck in here. Okay, I think I just made what might be a bit of a mistake. Finding that uh, sleeping bag, which by the way, turns out to be a, only a summer weight sleeping bag. Uh, I, and, and that beer, and uh, with the storm raging outside, I, I closed my eyes and I actually started to fall asleep. Didn't sleep much last night. But I've just woken up, it's three o'clock, sun's going down already. And I've just lost some valuable time, time I could have used to be proactive and to get some firewood maybe together, or a little bit clearer understanding of where I am. Big mistake, hopefully not too big. Now that drone shot was either a shot that we got um, the original day, so it's just giving you that perspective again, or I'm not sure if the guys were back at the lodge and they just did a big long distance flight with it and said, well, we'll fly it over uh, his car sort of thing. Because I would have told them like, don't, don't bother me. They're not allowed to come and see me. So, uh, I can't, I, I can't remember, but it would have been one or the other. And then it just gives you a bit of perspective on, on where I am. Waiting to see how things might turn out is one thing. 
but procrastination in a survival situation is always a bad thing. And I'm no more immune to it than anyone else. All of the books say that you can take the edge off of the cold inside of a vehicle in the wintertime by having a candle lit. Well, I have tried this before. Now, to be honest, it was about minus 25, maybe even minus 30 degrees Celsius. It was really, really cold. It didn't work at all. It was just still cold. I mean, the, 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 the candle flame made no difference whatsoever. It's not that cold here now, so I'd say it's maybe about minus five or minus 10 tonight. If I keep starting up the car to turn on the heat, which I've been doing, sooner or later, there's gonna be zero gas left. On the other hand, if I keep using up these matches, that could be deadly too. I wanna be able to get a fire going if I need to. Let me go. One candle heat. Let's hope it's enough to uh, take the edge off of the cold inside this car. I'm always trying to save something for later in a survival situation. In this case, the candle will help me save the car gas. Surrounded by the protective shell of my car, with wet and cold wind blowing outside, the psychological challenge of whether or not to leave is profound as my stomach growls. Okay. Here's the deal on the candle. I think it maybe takes uh, a slight chill out of the air, but I think the best part is just simply that I have light uh, when it's dark here for a very long time. It's hard to tell if, uh, I mean, it's cold in here, so it's hard to tell if the candle's doing anything at all. I, I can't imagine it doing much good when it's minus 30 Celsius or something like that, or brutally cold. Uh, it might be helping tonight though, but it's still cold. And, uh, this summer sleeping bag is helping a lot, actually. A lot more than I was uh, expecting that it would. So that's good, but it's still, still easy to be chilled through the night. And I don't want to turn the car back on and risk burning up any more gas. I'm temporarily safe in the car, but I don't know how much longer I can just be stuck here. After two days, no one has come by. I don't know when the car will run out of gas completely but I do know what to expect once I leave the safety of the car, and that's the problem. Actually, I forgot about that. There was always going to be a chance that someone might just come by, and if that had happened, I would have played into that and said, okay, look at this. This is how, you know, maybe this is how that survival story ends. Uh, or I would have said, you know, it could have ended right here because some people came by, but I'm going to stay and continue on filming the show. I don't know. But no one did come by, and this is just a regular road in the mountains in Norway. So... The thought that you could wait for someone to come by, it shows you, you know, that could be the, the death of you. Problem. For now, the car still feels like a refuge. It still feels protective. That's where I sort of, you know, back away my, my push that you really should leave right away and, and take yourself out the way you came, is that it just felt so protected inside that car because the w bad weather came in the next morning kind of immediately and stayed and I didn't want to leave out into that wicked blowing wind uh, and walk 50 miles sort of thing uh, that wouldn't make sense so I see why people stay in the car it's just rarely the most advisable thing to do situation you're either dealing with weather or you're preparing for weather one or the other there's no in between this weather is the worst kind cold and wet it's the type of chill that gets right through to my bones, and nothing will make my core body temperature chill to the point of hypothermia faster than wet and windy weather. And hypothermia can kill. Keep thinking I can get outside, hear it stop, all good. It just picks up again. It's a waiting game. And it's a waiting game with potentially deadly consequences if the wrong decision is made due to impatience. Wet snow is tougher survival than cold or dry snow. So why leave the safety of this car to venture out into the freezing rain? It's a dangerous thing to do. I'm beginning to understand why people stick with their vehicles, even when they know the way out. It keeps coming to me just how reasonable it seems now for people to just stay with their vehicle. Who wants to go outside in wicked weather when you're tired, you're hungry, you're cold, uh, maybe you don't have proper shoes or proper coat? That would be a tough decision to make to leave the vehicle under circumstances like this. Yeah, I am remembering that now. And that's very true. I mean, just wet, wet snow, uh, 
you know, the combination of snow, rain, wet, freezing rain, wet snow, far worse than, you know, nice dry blowing snow. If you're dressed properly, uh, it just soaks you through to the bone, which we will find out in, in the second episode of this. Yet waiting too many days to make a move while my energy reserves and my body slowly burn up can be a dangerous thing to do too. Even though the car represents a significant cocoon and protection from the elements, I'm nearly out of food and it doesn't take long to begin to feel frustrated by its small living space. This isn't surviving, this is just being trapped. I need to find a way to make a move, get out of here. Or they'll be uh, coming to haul this car away with a skeleton inside of it this spring. Yet no matter how much I want to leave, the car is still much better than having to sleep at the base of a tree in the wet snow. For the moment, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages of abandoning my ready-made shelter. But I can't stay here forever. I think one of the most underestimated problems of survival is actually boredom. <sighs> the biggest thing for me to stave off that boredom so far has been sleeping. I think people forget to sleep. They do the all-night push. They go hard. They want to survive. They want and they get themselves in more trouble and now they haven't slept at all. Now their mind's not thinking clearly. There's an old saying in survival, if you don't have to stand up, sit down. If you don't have to sit down, lie down. If you don't have to be awake, sleep. A lot of bad decisions are made by people who have not had enough sleep. Sometimes those decisions can be fatal. Uh, the best way for me to kill boredom, well, that option's off the table because I'm alone. But at least I do have my harmonica, one of my favorite ways to kill boredom. Along with humor, any distraction can bring levity and get my mind thinking on solutions to the problem of survival and self-rescue. Definitely starting to feel like a bit of a prisoner in this car. I think I'm going to rip into it, see if I can make myself some kind of portable shelter I'm gonna use up some of the precious car gas so I can have the lights on, so I can work. Otherwise, it's time to get busy. Being squeamish about whether or not to break apart and destroy my car wouldn't go hand in hand with effective survival. I loved this part uh, of when, when I could get busy again. You can almost see it in my face, it's time for me to get busy. I like that. It was always it was so great when I knew, all right, I'm gonna do this. And in this case, I. I think I'm looking for shelter materials and I think I'm about to make some boots. And it's just, it was exciting, it was, it was energizing because now it's, you know, two, three, four days without food and uh, it's, it, you, the, all of a sudden there's this boost of energy and adrenaline simply because I got a plan. That's just a big rubber strap, good to use as a pull along rather than use up any uh, valuable rope I might have. It's been three days and no one's come along, so I can't be shy or passive when it comes to making my life better in this survival situation. I see some potential to make a shelter out of some of this stuff. And the rest of it's gonna be too heavy or too odd shaped. It's about three in the morning and the uh, rain's still coming down. Rain and snow, actually. So it's good that I'm starting to get proactive. I wanna make sure that I get a toboggan made Make sure I protect my feet and find some way of making some sort of shelter. I'm not sure I'm going to do that yet. I just know I want to get out of this car. It feels like being trapped. Okay, I've been thinking it through. I think I'll have enough material kicking around to uh, protect my hikers using the floor mats. Ingenious. Out of my survival bracelet comes this much rope that I can use. And I do have, I don't want to be holding that. So clearly I liked that survival bracelet, but I remember it taking forever to get it unwound. Maybe that's my only beef with them is they just take too long to unwind. So if you make those things and sell them, make it so you can unwind them really quickly. Do that for me and I'll, I'd be happy with that little survival kit. Holding out on you, but of course I never go anywhere without a multi-tool. Little wire from the back of the seat. That might work. Must have been a shoemaker in my past life. A 
Well, there we go, held together by wires for now. I forgot that I did this actually. I remember making boots, but I forgot that I, that I used the floor mats. Uh, you know, just, as I said, it's been a long time since I've seen a lot of this footage. might work. No, I don't think that front part's gonna hold for very long, so I have to strengthen that. These might look silly, but if they keep my toes from becoming frostbitten, they won't be so silly after all. Oh, I think I should patent those. Four days now trapped in this car by mountain weather. Still coming down. One time I remember surviving in a life raft for uh, the better part of a week, uh, and that was brutal. And uh, this is starting to border on that. The sort of inactivity and the inability to move on or get out of the situation is pretty frustrating. Got to remember, all I'm really doing here is simulating what a lot of people do in a situation like this is stay put with the vehicle until they get to a point where I'm at now where I'm just about completely out of food. So I gotta keep finding ways to make myself mobile so I can travel long distances through the mountain. Breakfast. And that's the last of the Mandarin Orange. Finally freed from bad weather, my chance to get out of my car prison comes. I've hardly moved about physically in four days. I'm almost out of gas from turning the engine over to stay warm. So if I can get a big fire going now, I can warm up and move around enough outside while I keep working on a plan to get out of here. I'm just gonna see what I can get done before any bad weather comes in. When I checked out my surroundings earlier on, I did see some fallen down trees that I could bring back a little bit more substantial. And that's the benefit of going out and assessing the area all around you, including your sort of your expanded area as you see what resources are around. And I'm gonna make use of them. With a short break in the bad weather, it feels good to get the muscles moving and the blood flowing again, but it comes at a price. This is where uh, a couple days without food, that's when you start to feel it. Simple movement can make me lightheaded and dizzy now that my reserves of energy in my body are being utilized for survival. You see, even in the wintertime, there's always tinder somewhere. You've got to keep your eye out for any advantage to surviving, and fire preparation <sighs> is vital. All right, I guess I'll put this about here. I want to be sort of be able to sit in the car if I got a fire going, get a bit of heat. The greatest obstacle to face when getting a good fire going while surrounded by wet snow is simply diligent preparation. Making sure I have everything just right and enough of all of my supplies before I take what might be my only chance at getting a fire going. That's vital. It's the rushed fire starting that blows it. You need to take more time preparing to get a fire going than you do actually attempting to light the fire. So, you know, often in a case like this, it probably took me an hour or longer just prepping the fire. That's vital. Here's a quick little tidbit for you. If you wanna, if you wanna really hone in your, your fire starting skills and be really good at it, really confident at it, which brings about a great deal of general wilderness confidence anyway, then what I did was this. When I was an outdoor guide, uh, I spent one summer lighting fires, you know, probably uh, 150 fires. That one summer, I would only allow myself, even with high paying clients who are still sleeping snugly in their tents, waiting to get, to get up and have coffee and breakfast, and I'm the guide, and I had to start that morning fire, even then, every single fire that summer, I started with a magnesium flint striker. So a, a ferrule rod with the sparking and some magnesium that if I wanted to use the magnesium shavings, I could. The next summer, I did it again, but only with rock and steel and charred cloth. And the third summer, 
you guessed it, only the fire bow. And when you have to get a fire going that way, so the next time you go to your cottage, your cabin, camping, don't allow yourself to use your matches or lighter. Force yourself to use first um, a, a flint and striker, and then maybe maybe the next year, rock and steel, and then, and then fire bow. Force yourself to use methods like that. And it's amazing how good you get at starting a fire. So try that. I would always say that the measure of a, not just a good guide, but a great guide, is it's been pouring rain for four or five days on, on the journey, and you can get a tarp set up, a roaring fire going, you bring out the scotch and the dark chocolate. That's a good guide, and you should be able to do that too. Just try to create some sort of base to put the fire on, protect it from the snow below. Gotta always stand up my ax, my saw blade. If I don't, snow like this, or even brown leaves and stuff, you lose them real quickly. Losing an ax and a saw in a situation like this will just bite. It's really vital in a survival situation that you slow down and you don't rush around. You can injure yourself and make things a lot tougher for yourself. Now, if you're actually the one trying to affect survival, maybe get a fire going, build a shelter, find food, and you're looking after some people, then I've got to make sure that I'm safe First, if I start jumping into a situation because I'm all panicky and I want to get a fire going badly, I can end up injuring myself and uh, then I'm no good to them. That's why firemen have the saying, gas, glass, or wire. You're checking for gas spilled, you're checking for broken glass, you're checking for electrocution. All of these things you check for first before you go in to save someone else or you just make a bad situation worse. Okay, I'm just gonna keep building this up until I've got a nice big pile. And then, I'm gonna go siphon some gas. So here's my plan. Siphon a bit of gas out of the vehicle, take a spark from the battery to ignite it. I just have to hope that it'll reach down. The reason being, to save on matches. That's why I teach charred cloth. It's a method you can use to save on matches or save on your lighter and it's fluid. So in a survival situation, you might have a lighter, you might have matches, but if you can get a fire going without using them, because they're so much easier to use, you have them in reserve for the next time, or when you can't get a fire going with an alternative method, like using the sun through a lens or a spark. All right, so the trick to siphoning is not to breathe in, because obviously that's gonna make you violently sick. So the trick is just to only use your mouth it's like using it like a straw, but you don't suck like you've got a straw. This is not chocolate milkshake down there. Mm. I know this is nothing for old timers, and it's just a normal part of rural living, but it's still pretty unpleasant, no matter who you are. recommend highly that you never do this unless you really know what you're doing and it's a real dire survival situation because uh, uh, that's a horrible thing to do. I'm just gonna make use of the car instruction manual. Perfect tinder, ready to go. There's not that much gas in the can. So it shouldn't be too bad, but I don't really know. So I'm gonna watch my eyes, I'm gonna watch everything and give it a shot here. Fire starting using sparks and gasoline is dubious at the best of times, but when survival depends upon it, it takes on a whole new intensity. Let's try this way then. There we go. Finally, after four days stuck in the car, this fire will be a huge boost psychologically. So the trick there, is you're not trying to spark the liquid gasoline, you're trying to spark the vapors coming off the gasoline. That's what takes a spark. So if you're ever trying to use gasoline to get a fire going and you don't have a lit flame, you're using sparks, remember it's the fumes that you're sparking, not the gasoline itself. Didn't quite go as planned. 
In this damp snow, I've got to work extra hard to keep this going. Diligence is always required if I want to stay warm, and the added advantage is that the fire serves as a signal for potential rescuers. They're more likely to go to investigate a car with a fire burning behind it than simply a dark car sitting in the snow. See, even me, with years and years and years of fire starting experience, that's a precarious situation in lighting that fire. And so the diligence that's required is, is uh, pretty potent. And you can see from my body language there, I'm not talking to you, I'm not talking to the camera, I'm just concentrating on that fire because I could lose it really quickly. Seeing all the panic, I didn't even remember to use the tinder I'd gathered. I'm gonna use it now. Well, this instruction manual came in handy. Keeping a large amount of ready-to-go tinder and kindling for the fire is vital to success, but battling the elements is always a challenge to staying warm. Stop raining. Clouds look thick that are coming my way as well. It worked. It took a while to get that spark to take. I had to pour the gas over onto the paper, try to spread it out. I don't know, I, th I thought it would have gone better inside the, uh, the, the beer can with the fumes and everything, but it didn't seem to make any difference. Got it to take, ran over here, but then I noticed after a while when the fire was burning that it wasn't burning down into my wood. It's because the pot lid was still underneath it, stopping the fire from going down, so I had to pull the pot lid out, which caused more trouble with the fire. So I grabbed a piece of the inside of the car. It was just like, I don't know, compressed board sort of stuff and threw it underneath and it's burning and uh, that's keeping the fire going. Now I can heat water up over top of the fire. That's one way to save a match. The car heater was... I mean, stop that and say that, um, you see, so what got the fire going for me was, uh, was, was garbage basically. It was, it was ripping something out from inside the car. And in a survival situation, it's not nice for the environment, but plastic, rubber, that's what can keep your fire going, keep it hot, make big black smoke. Uh, you burn what you need to, to stay alive. Nice, but a full fire begins to put motivation into me like nothing else can. If I remember correctly, I think I saw an old pallet some workers must have left behind in the road here. And if it's not too rotten, uh, I'm gonna bring it in, because that'll burn up well for me. A little bit of a hike back, though. Once again, keeping an eye out for survival advantages pays off. Shows you whenever you're anywhere near civilization, there's always some junk lying around you can make use of. And just paying attention to what's around you is so vital. I remembered that I saw a piece of pallet plywood when I was doing my reconnaissance mission, when I walked down that road and came back again. So, and then I'm thinking, okay, I could, that's gonna be, that's easy, it's easy wood, much easier than trying to cut trees down. If the weather could stay like this, I could get out of here. In fact, on a tangent note, when it comes to apocalyptic survival, uh, which is a, a show that I might do yet, um, one of the things I love to point out is that of course, you actually still need to get fires going. Uh, maybe there's no propane, no gas, no electricity, and you want to get a fire going to cook your food. And one of the best supplies of firewood you can get, assuming that you're not stealing, or sealing if it's the apocalypse, I suppose, pallets of wood in behind industrial buildings. Those are amazing supplies of firewood. A lot of times, they don't even care if you take them. I mean, like nowadays, maybe not in the apocalypse, or World War III, but in any event, uh, pallets of wood stacked up, usually in behind big industrial buildings, an amazing firewood supply. Plastic doesn't rip on me, this should work well. That's a sharp knife. I got a way of pulling this thing. It's nice to think about moving on. Smoke in the eyes. That toboggan should work well, I think. Now I want to think about forms of shelter so that I can travel and I can have something to cover myself up with. I have no idea of knowing how long I'm going to be out in that bush. 
So if I take some shelter with me, it's not going to be such a worry. This was a better day, better afternoon anyway. I should point out that uh, you've, some of you have heard me tell the stories in the other director's commentaries that are on this channel, uh, as I've been doing my entire catalog, uh, that um, originally on the early Survivor Man episodes, maybe season one, season two, um, I had contact lenses. So I had to take like spare contact lenses with me. I had to take my lenses out at night, put them in in the morning with dirty fingers. But before this season, I'm pretty sure I'd finally gone in and gotten my eyes lasered. What I didn't know is that all those years, I could practically look into the fire and have smoke billowing in my face and never bothered me. I thought I had a superpower. No, it's just that the contact lenses were, were protecting my eyes. Without the contact lenses, now, as Survivor Man, always hovering over, fire, over a fire, it was painful because the smoke would go up into my eyes and be like, ah, because I wasn't familiar or used to that feeling of smoke getting in my eyes. Same thing with chopping onions. Took the contact lenses out, boom, the pain is there. So that was actually something new for me to experience while filming Survivor Man. Maybe I can get out of here tomorrow after all. I'm still concerned about my feet and them getting soaking wet and getting frostbite. It'd be good to have a pair of mucklucks. And I'm gonna have to make them out of the car. Okay, well that's got some promise. You know, I can never work these seat things in the back. I never get them to go up or down. It's like, okay, is there supposed to be a latch somewhere? I know they have room to move. This is a well-built car. I think I'll just cut and see what happens. Without a knife in the survival kit, this would have been nearly impossible. That's my tomogamy knife right there from uh, the Hella company in Norway. Uh, and this was fun. But again, I had to make sure I had permission to do this because um, I knew that when I went in with the car that it was possible that I was going to rip into the car and, and do some things with it. Uh, and uh, so I had to get permission. And away we go. Okay. I'm into something here. Okay. Well, that's insulation. point of this come on you gotta admit this is fun it's, it's that my feet are more important than the car my toes are more important than the car and my life is more important than the upholstery fortunately i actually used to make my own mucklucks running dog teams so i've got some idea of how it should work but true story uh i'm not going to be cutting out any patterns here it's like skinning an animal Except too bad this wasn't a slab of meat. Won't be pretty, but if it saves my toes, I don't care. I wouldn't mind using some of this foam for insulation inside them. It almost looks like this is ready-made. Bottom, side, toe. A little bit of ingenuity in a survival situation goes a long way. And this was one of the situations that occurred for real with the Stolpas. They, I believe, in the end lost some toes. Uh, with their particular survival ordeal, which was for real, and they had a young baby with them as well. And they could have done this, but they wouldn't have ripped apart their own car, right? But they could have done this to save their feet. Uh, and that's why I like showing this is, and, and making that point that, you know what, my feet and my survival are more important than the upholstery of this car. I can replace car seats. Found the uh, stuff sack for the sleeping bag. Well, might look silly, but so would my feet with a few less toes. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Ah, it's feeling better. It's feeling like it's not gonna come off. I like it. It's a little unorthodox, but uh, that's gonna work. The other good thing about walking in mucklucks as opposed to 
hard soled boots is that your feet move around a lot more inside. So they actually tend to, I find mine always tend to stay warmer that way. We'll see if the weather lets me travel tomorrow. If not, I'm stuck in here again and I'm out of food now. What I need is cold, hard snow to make the walking easier. Well, I may have a summer weight sleeping bag and the candle lit, but every time I hear the wind just howl outside, the cold starts to come right into the car. And uh, what I've got to do, this is, this is really helpful actually, is stretch. I do a lot of stretching. Once I stretch like this, I can get the blood flowing back into my, my veins. I don't care what kind of stretches, as long as there's something going on. Oh, and, and once I do that, and I add to that something like this, I can't do push-ups in here, but I can do like one, two, three, four, five. And it does a lot to, uh, to warm me up and just sort of knock the chill out of my bones so that I can uh, get another 20 minutes sleep. I remember in the, uh, the Rocky Mountain episode where I was dropped off by helicopter up by a glacier, I remember coming down through the, the Alpine area and sleeping under a rock. It was awful. It was one of the worst ever. And what I did there was it was a, it was a technique of like scrunching my toes, scrunching my feet, flexing my calves, squeezing my, my quads, my butt, my stomach, my chest, my arms, my neck, and then right back down again and doing all of that, contracting of the muscles up and down while you're kind of trying, you know, just hiding from the cold uh, can warm you up. It gets the blood moving and can get you warm. And then what do you get? You get about 20 minutes sleep and you've got to do it again. But 20 minutes sleep is better than no sleep at all. It's time to see what happens when I leave the safety of the car and search for ways to find or catch food. For now, I only feel trapped. Okay. That's another morning, sky is very gray, and there's been freezing rain falling on the car for the last little while, last half hour or so, but it's stopped now for about 15 minutes. I'm gonna wait and see if I can get a move on and get out of this car and start trying to beeline somewhere, anywhere. Dodging in and out of the bad weather seems to be my greatest challenge. It's actually gotten much colder, which is a good thing, because all that wet weather is a killer. At least with this cold weather now, things frozen up a bit, I can make some tracks and start traveling. Get out of this prison. But before I do, I think what I'd like to do is bring some gas with me. I've got that leftover peanut butter jar. There's no reason not to make use of it. Oh, I hate that. Well, it's pouring out good now. There we go. Oh, it's peanut butter gas. Forgot I did this. I wonder what happens when you put peanut butter and gas together. I don't really have a clue how yet, but somehow this might all make up my shelter. I'm sort of improvising as I go here. There's lots of different side roads going off of the main road. Now that the ground is mostly frozen, it's much better for walking. I just gotta hope that that sled holds out. And I'll pull it along the way. I've got my backpack for my camera gear. I think I've got a clear sky for at least a moment anyway. I'm trying to find a way where I can survive and make it back to safety and not hopefully end up with a miserable night out in wet snow and the rain in the bush. And I think this is pretty much how I planned it out was to be like, okay, if I'm going out for 10 days, how about the first half, so to speak, the majority of that be stuck in a car. And again, it's a scenario, survival scenario. And then the second half, I've got to go somewhere. Where can I go? And then that's when I discovered, okay, in Norway. And, and this one was going to be similar to the Labrador one, which coincidentally was, was also in the snow, uh, where I knew there, there might be uh, trapper cabins, survival cabins, uh, even uh, cabins down by the fjord, uh, you know, cottage cabins that I could come across. And I've always enjoyed showing that because that's very much a reality in a survival situation that you might have to break into somewhere and stay in there for survival. I also enjoyed it because I knew it would be at least easier than having to build a shelter all the time. So I think uh, that's what's gonna happen here. I'm not sure how much more 
How f I can't remember now. Well, let's go find out how far I get into the bush after spending four days uh, and nights in stuck in that car, in that little car prison after a while. Because if I do, then that car is going to start looking pretty nice. My initial huge advantage is that I have roads to walk on. But this will be a good exercise surviving in areas where I should be able to find people, but can't. Whatever I face now, nearly five days trapped in a car is long enough. It's time for self-rescue in the hopes that what's out there is better than what I'm leaving behind. That's an important point. It's time for self-rescue in the hopes that what's out there is better than what I'm leaving behind. I'm trying to better my survival situation. The smart thing would have been to leave on the first day, full of energy and uh, food, and uh, like I think maybe immediately make the boots. I had the big coat anyway, and just start hiking out the way I came. That would be the thing you would really do in a survival situation here. But I was extending this whole survival story, if you will, into a 10-day scenario, which also could very well happen. Uh, and a lot of people do make it happen this way, where they don't go back the way they came, they head off in some other direction, which is what I'm about to do. The backpack has all of my camera gear and that sleeping bag in it, so it's fortunate that I had this. That's awesome, because there's a lot of camera batteries to carry, but it also keeps the sleeping bag protected if it does come back on to rain. So, a little bit of a cheat there in that I needed the backpack for the camera gear, but I could then also use the backpack to carry some of my found survival gear or the survival gear that was in the car. So, uh, had to be. Got to have that camera gear. There's no point in me doing this. No. It's mind-boggling how many survival stories exist where people had to endure an ordeal in areas where they should have been able to find help, yet didn't. And sometimes human tracks can be very misleading and take you off into places more dangerous for survival than where you came from. It's the inherent danger of moving forward into the unknown of a survival situation. As you can see, there's tire impressions on this road. Fairly fresh, too. So there's definitely some people out here somewhere. And I can tell by the way the snow's falling. Unfortunately, they lead uphill. So that's the direction I'm heading for now. You can see that little old first generation GoPro on my chest in that shot. I have no way of knowing how far these tire tracks go. They could go another 50 miles, for all I know. It's real easy to get hot and sweaty doing this. That's a problem, because if you sweat, you die. Fortunately, the temperatures are only about 10 degrees or so below freezing, which means I still have access to some fresh running streams. Though I've never had an issue eating snow, so long as my body is warm during the day, it's a lot better to be able to drink freely from already melted water. And ironically, I need to keep myself from overheating and sweating while I hike up these mountain roads. To eat snow or not to eat snow. Uh, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm definitely a supporter of during the day, while you're hot, while you're staying sweaty and warm and hot and all the rest of it, uh, uh, go ahead and eat snow. You need to constantly hydrate. And it's when you get, it gets to about 4.30 in the afternoon and you start cooling down, that's when you stop. But along the way, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Staying hydrated, just vital in the winter bush. It's hard to do. You don't think about drinking water because you're around all this snow. But dehydrated out here can lead to hypothermia. I'm following human tracks, but they just keep on going. Nothing in sight yet, so I'm gonna take a break. Night's coming soon, and uh, my toes are frozen. I'm gonna switch to uh, my homemade mucklucks. The snow off the side of the trail is super deep. I'm gonna settle in here. I gotta take a break. It's a frustrating paradox. You wanna move as fast as you can to get to where you wanna be to get to safety. The quicker you move, the hotter you get, the more sweatier you get, the more dangerous it all becomes. It's one thing to get sweaty out in the winter wilderness. You know you're going home to a warm bed and a hot shower. It's quite something else when you don't know where you're going to end up. These poor old hikers are great boots, but they're not keeping me warm in this temperature. Now is when the decision to sacrifice the insides of the car upholstery pays off and protects my feet. You know, you don't see an awful lot of, uh, you know, survival shows uh, certainly for a long time there with the dual survivals and this, that, that we're in the wintertime because it's so brutal to try to film 
the shows in the winter. <laughs> but I did quite a few, and uh, they were always brutal. Already feels warmer. Okay. Not necessarily a fashion statement, but I'd rather keep my toes. Huh. All right. Well, these boots are kind of acting like snowshoes, bonus. It's a little bit of a hole down there. If there's one pet peeve I have in survival instruction, it's that picture in every classic textbook of the, the perfect tree with the, the perfect hole underneath created by the boughs and the branches, and you can get in and have three feet or four feet of snow all around you for insulation. I've seen one in many, 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 many years of being out in the winter bush. They're just few and far between. You can't count on them. But this is a good start here. I think this is where I'll, where I'll work my shelter. One of my favorite pet peeves about survival books is that, that, that under the fir tree shelter that you see all the time, nonsense. Yeah. Oh, I saw you see them all the time. Do you really? Did you check them out? Did you investigate them? Could you really make a shelter down in there? Or did you ski by it or snowshoe by it? They are uh, very rare. I've seen, in all my travels, in all my years, I've seen one that I thought, that's kind of a perfect little shelter down there right now. A lot of the times, it's just, it's just bows into snow. It's not, I don't know why somebody got on that and they, they drew it into a book and then all the other books plagiarized from it. Uh, sometimes it's almost the exact same drawing, by the way. Uh, but no, don't count on that. You cannot count on that beautiful little fir tree or pine tree uh, where you get where you get the a hole underneath those boughs that is surrounded by the snow. You got to dig, no matter what. With rations long gone and two full days without any food at all, every effortful activity takes its toll on my energy reserves. This doesn't look all that arduous. Bear in mind, I think it's been, what is it, two days now without food? Two or one, I can't even remember anymore. Now I'm gonna go get some of that ready-made shelter material, courtesy of the car. Insulation from- And even th at that, as far as how many days without food, the last four days now, or five days, have been just that one mandarin orange and two tablespoons of peanut butter, some beer, and uh, I think there was a little bit of jerky in the beginning, that was it. From the ground is everything. The conduction through touching the ground and getting cold that way is pretty powerful. Not seeming like so much of a stupid idea now. If I had to make this shelter out of branches, it would exhaust me in no time flat. I've had better shelters, but this one's pretty solid. I'm up off the snow. That's the main thing. The yeah, big problem is that I don't have a roof, so it's more of a protection from wind and a place for me to try to curl up into a ball, I guess. Beats curling up in the snow. My six hours of daylight in the Norwegian wilderness are over as the night moves in fast. All right, this is it. This is my spot for the night. Full moon's finished now, so it gets very dark early. I'm wearing pretty much everything that I have. Every scrap I could find, I'm wearing or wrapped around me. Got the sleeping bag wrapped up around me and underneath me. I'm on a solid wood platform between me and the snow, and it makes such a huge difference. I can't think anymore. I need some food. Being able to think clearly in any survival situation is vital, and the biggest challenge to that is lack of sleep. I have a feeling this is gonna be a long night, and I have a second feeling that I'm not gonna be sleeping much. Right now, that car's looking pretty good. I'm only halfway to surviving a full 10 days. Survival victims have walked roads for days and even weeks, only to perish in the end. There are thousands of miles of snow-covered roads on this planet, and not all of them lead to safety. Yet they compel you to keep moving. They always offer the illusion of the way home. But far down below is where my final destination lay, the edge of the ocean, where rescuers will look for me after a full 10 days, but not yet. Not for another five days, without food, without safety. There are abandoned cabins. There are also areas of cliffs that are seemingly impossible to hike around. Should I decide to leave the road and make a beeline for the fjord down below? 
It would be a steep and slippery climb down, and landing at the top of a cliff would be disastrous. Cool. All right, there you go. That is the first episode of the Norway 10 Days. And a lot of you have been asking for this, and I know you're really looking forward to the next episode because we know what happens. If you haven't seen that show, you can watch it now. You can see these uninterrupted, uh, no director's commentary, right now on the channel, on the on this YouTube channel you're watching, uh, in the playlist, go to the playlist, director's comment, oh, go to the playlist season, I don't know what season it is, season four maybe? So thanks for joining me for this, uh, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting to the next one, which will probably be, probably come a week after this one. Uh, and yeah, so exciting. Remember, my new children's book, remember, it's an award-winning book, and it's great for your kids. It's all about getting them in the out of doors. It uh, tells them s stories, uh, Survivor Man adventures, what I learned on those adventures, and it even gives them activities they can do. And don't forget my series, Wild Harvest, if you want to learn about local foraging. It's a beautiful very calm, very gentle series on this YouTube channel. Uh, in the United States, you can also see it on uh, uh, PBS stations. And in Canada, you can see it on uh, Cottage Life Television. Uh, but there you go, guys. Uh, that's Norway, part one, director's commentary. I don't know what else I have to tell you. I'm getting hungry. See you in a bit.